this morning. Miss Courtney is going to sing a song for us. My allergies have been bothering me for several weeks, so I'm going to try to sing, but most of Brooks is listening to me again. It's okay. <laughs> Amen. Don't go to Children's Church. Hey, go back to uh, Revelations chapter 20. Revelation. I'm going to keep doing it. Why did I do that for? No S on that. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. We're going to be talking about heaven this morning. Uh, again, uh, I like it. I tell you what, I, I, I don't think 
if there's any other book in the Bible that's more controversial amongst theologians than Revelation. I, I kid you not. Once you open it up and you go to study and look at specific words and meanings and, and interpretations and is this figuratively speaking or is it literal? And uh, I don't think nobody ag agrees. I'm serious. There's very few people agrees on that. Uh, different, just different things, uh, different approaches. So as you study the Word of God, I, you know, I try to make you aware of those things and some of the different uh, theological views that's out there. Uh, and so once you go, because you'll go sit in a service somewhere, as I promise you, you will. If you go to church much, you'll go sit in a service. You might hear a revival. And somebody will go preaching on in in this book here, and you'll say, "Well, I never heard that," you know. And, and it's, it's it's true. You probably there's going to be things you probably you won't hear it here. You might hear it somewhere else. Uh, so when I just want you to be aware of that when we talking about the scriptures and and uh, talking about heaven, uh, you know, we, we talked about whether it's a new heaven, new earth, and whether this one will completely be destroyed and recreated by God or whether it go or go through a re, 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 renovation process, you know, just like that, theology, the, uh, that theological view. And, and some of the well-known preachers that you see on TV uh, has different views on, on that particular subject. And, and heaven and what we're getting you know, get ready to move into, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, uh, you know, not to be confused with... Uh, the uh, temple or tabernacle that will be built during the millennial uh, reign of Christ uh, over in the Middle East area. Uh, but this is the, the new heaven, the new earth uh, we talked about. And we looked down in verse 2, uh, and, and we said here that there's a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And we looked at those scriptures that are prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So this is this city is a holy city come, coming down uh, from heaven, and uh, so there's that's where we're we're headed. We're getting ready to get into the portion of scripture where it gets very descriptive about this holy city coming down from heaven, and we're going to go. Uh, this is not really normal for us that on Sunday morning, of course, on Wednesday night we go verse by verse, uh, and we're in the book of Acts, and we're fixing to open up the fifteenth chapter of the book of Acts. And I love our Wednesday night study. I tell you what, uh, as a preacher, I think I've, I've grown more uh, by taking the scriptures and looking at it and being very specific about words and verses and places and times. It, it's really opened my eyes to a lot of the spiritual truths that I was missing before. Uh, but just this, uh, this morning and last week, we started in chapter 21, and we're going to continue to go through uh, chapter 21 and 22, the last chapters of the Bible. Uh, and looking at heaven, and we're going to take this again, uh, verse by verse, and uh, see what God has for us. So what we covered several things. I, I'm not going to go through uh, the introduction again. I, I think about all of you here has uh, uh, been in the services. You know what we've preached over the last several weeks uh, concerning heaven. Uh, last week, we sort of stopped off at verse 5 of you know, chapter 21, uh, verse 5, if you want to look at that. And uh, I'll tell you what, stand up and we'll let you stretch your legs and I'm going to read, I'll read verse 5 and let's get down through verse 8 and we'll take a look at those verses. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Uh, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the adulterers, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let us pray. Father, open up our hearts and minds to the scriptures this morning. God, may we be pleased with everything that's said and done. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, look at that. Uh, we, we, we preached a little about, about you know, verse 5 last week. But he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And said unto them, he said, Write these things, uh, these words, and they are true and faithful. He said, You know, I make. That's in the present tense. 
He, you know, God, this ain't something we're, we're waiting for. He's in the process of making all things new now. And he, he begins with us as we preach uh, with salvation. We're new creatures. That's what it said. All this says perfectly. As you, as you begin to look at it and you look at things that's going to be new, things that are new, and, and you start with our life right now, uh, we have a new life in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. And we preached on that. So when we think about God making things new, uh, he's in the process. He says, I am making. That's present tense. He's still working on me and you. Uh, we're preparing ourselves, and we're going to look at these scriptures as the bride of Christ, but we're preparing ourselves to meet God, right? I hope that's what we're doing. And, you know, I fail every day. I struggle every day just like you. I struggle with, I struggle with me. I am, I, listen, the biggest problem in this world is not everybody else on the horizontal plane. The biggest problem is me. That's what we all have to admit. It's, it's us. I struggle with me. I struggle with the acceptance of people, their behaviors, and all these things. That's me. I get upset about it, you know, and things like that. God's still working on me. And I hope uh, that you are allowing God to work in your life and to change you, to mold you uh, according to the Scriptures so that we don't talk to people like, uh, like we shouldn't talk to people. We behave as we should. We react to people. We love people like we should. So when he says, I'm making all things new, it's in the present tense. And that new is fresh, refreshed, unused, fresh. Uh, and, you know, look at those words he said there. He said these words are, are true. That means they're genuine. I like for somebody to be genuine with me, don't you? Don't you like when you're having a conversation with somebody, don't you want them to tell you the truth? Right? Right. Yeah, you want people to be genuine. God's always genuine. He's true. He, he don't tell a lie. How do you think about that? He don't lie to us. What we're reading is true. It's not a lie. You know, I, I listen to, I, I read a lot of, phew, I sit there and I read until I just get so frustrated. Frustrated, and I, I, I just have to walk away. I do, John. I have to go downstairs, and just I turn a big fan on down there, and I sit there. I can't hear nothing with that fan. It helps me clear my head because I want to say this, want to say that. They'll say this ain't, this should be taken out of the Bible. I mean, they, you hear those things, They're, and these are by these are by the, theologians that people read after, and they say, well, that shouldn't even been in the Bible. But and you'll see, you'll hear that a lot when you study these these scriptures here. You will. They say well, that shouldn't be there. And you hear those things, and it, it gets frustrating. And you say, well, somebody's got to be lying here, ain't they? Somebody ain't telling the truth. But God's always telling the truth. That's one thing about God. He doesn't lie. And notice what he said, he's faithful. That means he's trustworthy. That's a good character for all of us to be, have to be trustworthy. That's what it's saying about God here. God's always trustworthy. I can always trust him to be there. And that's true. I can trust him when I need him. He's going to be there. You know, we can trust him, like we said, to speak the truth. I trust him. I trust him. He's going to help us. That's the stuff. That's the stuff we can have faith in God, knowing that these words and, th and what he's saying here is the words in this book is faithful and true. Yeah. See, people want to discredit the Bible. They will say, "Well, that's not the truth. That sounds like, that's the most silliest thing I've ever heard." People say that, but the words of God, in verse five, they are true and they're faithful. Words and he told him to write those things down. And then he began in verse six, and he said unto me, "It is done. It's done. It's finished." He said, "All, all that God has promised here, we come, we come down to this last book of the Bible, Revelation. We come to this last few chapters here." He said, "It's done." What does that mean? That means that all God has promised, the city that Abraham was looking for. All, all of it is done. It's finished. The work is done. We, we've saw, we saw the tribulation. We saw the millennial rank. We saw the great white throne judgment. We have saw ca a Satan cast into a lake of fire. It's done. All that I have promised to do, I did. That's what God's saying. These words are faithful and true. Well, that's a good God. That's a God we can trust. He said, it's done. I finished my work. And he says, uh, he said in the scripture here, uh, uh, in that verse, he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And, and these words here, this Alpha and Omega is the beginning uh, and the end. He says he's the beginning and the end. He's the beginning and the end of all things. Everything starts with God. Everything ends with God. Your life starts with God, and your life ends with God. God, God is the Alpha and the Omega. And that's the first 
uh, letter of the Greek alphabet, and omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Is why this in there, the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. People's got to realize that everybody's going to stand before God. They can say they ain't a heaven. They can say, I'm just going to die, and my body's just going to go back to ashes, dust, dirt. I ain't going to worry about standing before God. No, God is the beginning of life, and, and God is the end of life. We all will stand before the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one that's faithful and true, the one that does everything He's promised to do. That's God this morning. Everything. He said, I, I've done it. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And he says here, and I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. That fountain of the water of life freely. Well, look at that term. You know, water is critical, isn't it? You can, we can survive without water. It is critical for our, our physical bodies. We've got to have water. You know, I love tea. Well, I couldn't make tea without water. Well, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be in bad shape. I'll be honest with you. I grew up drink, drinking sweet tea. Anybody drinking sweet tea? You know, I like sweet tea? I like sweet tea. When I left home, I took Mama's little green coffee cup. And so what was that? It's, I say when I put in, when I say I put two and a half cups in, I ain't talking about two and a half measures. I don't know how much is in that little cup. But I took that little cup because I told Mama, I said, you make the best tea. Can I have you measuring cup so I know how much sugar to put in it? And I listen, I've had that, I've had that little cup. It's in my it's in my house there, right in the cabinet at home. When I make tea this week, I'll use that little green cup. It's a little green. I don't know if you remember back in the 70s, uh, and, and, and that area, you didn't have a whole lot. Your dinnerware, everything was plastic. You know? Coffee cups was plastic. You even come with a little saucer to set it in. I ain't got the saucer, but I got the cup. So when you think about uh, these things, water is critical. For everything we do in life, you couldn't cook. You couldn't cook without water. You had everything, so that's critical for us physically to survive. We have to have. But spiritually speaking, when we look at this scripture here, uh, we all have a great spiritual need. And see, that's the one that a lot of people they don't see themselves as lost. They don't see themselves as having a spiritual need in their life. And, and, and what they do, we all have that spiritual need. And some people seek to satisfy that need in the world. We all did. Uh, before salvation, what do we do? We run to the devil. We run. We we run to the world, seeking to be satisfied. Somebody somebody chose alcohol. Somebody chose drugs. Somebody somebody chose 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 some sexual ex escapade. Somebody might have chose wealth, fame, job. Everybody's looking and searching and longing for something deep down in their heart. You have a space in your heart here. There's something, and God created you that way. He, he created you to know Him. He created you to have a relationship for Him. When He says here, uh, a thirst, I don't know, have you ever been really thirsty? John said this in, in, in the morning. He said, uh, he said uh, we use this term, I'm starved to death. We, we've also used that term in, when we're speaking of I'm thirsty. Oh, gosh. My boys, I don't know. <laughs> Yesterday, we went out with these kids. Listen, we drove, we just got to the putt putt place. Now, we just picked them up. Listen, we get out on the earth, and they get out on the shelf of the earth. I bet you I have I had three different ones here. I'm so thirsty. You got some water? I said, no, we ain't got no water we're going to need after we leave here. But, you know, we like that. I'm about to thirst. But it's like John said this morning, I've never starved. I've, I've never really been thirsty, not to the point where I didn't have water. I knew I could get something. A thirst. It's a longing, a hunger. Uh, you know, we want... Uh, that thirst to be satisfied. And we have to think, look at this scripture, what he's saying here. He says, I give in to, he, give in to him. That is a, a thirst. That means you're thirsty, but he's not speaking in the physical sense that you're thirsty. He's speaking spiritually. Spiritually. You're, you're longing. And, and oftentimes, you'll see, if you study the scriptures any time at all, you'll see water and thirst and uh and drinking is a common picture in the Bible to show us a spiritual need of something of that nature. So, we, and I, I'll give you an example. Let me say this. When we look at this example and say this, the thirst that you have, the world can't satisfy. Only God can satisfy this thirst. You say, what all this, what's all this got to do with heaven? 
Well, in heaven, we'll be completely satisfied. We'll have that, that we won't thirst again. There'll be no more thirst in heaven. In John 4, 10, he says this, And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith it unto me, give me to drink. Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Some of you know where that scripture comes from. Uh, that was uh, Jesus. Uh, the disciples went in. He said, y'all going into town here. I'm going to go up here at the well. And, and Jesus knew he had an appointment with a Samaritan woman up at the well. And he went up by the well. And, and she come during a time where none of the other ladies would be there. Because <coughs> she didn't want them, them talking about it. So she went up the well. So why do you say that, preacher? Because uh, she was really a, like a harlot, wasn't she? She, she? she had several husbands and the one she was shacked up with. You know that term shacked up is? Yeah, everybody knows what that mama said. You, you, you don't go shack up with somebody. That means you're living together and you're not married. She was shacked up with somebody else. And then she, she met Jesus up at the well. And he went to talking to her. And he, he actually told her about, he, he already knew all those things. He knew, he knew how many times she'd been married. He knew the guy she was living with. He knew this lady had a thirst. And she, was, she had been longing to have that filled to her relationship. Boy, you got to understand it. Now, I love my wife, and we have a wonderful marriage and relationship. I'm going to take nothing from it. But she can't satisfy the thirst that I have. She can't fix me spiritually. Only God can. So there's a lot of people, when you meet somebody out there, and they're living together, they won't commit to marriage. You know, a lot of times they're looking for, to be satisfied in a relationship. Through somebody else, when they need Jesus is what they need. They have a spiritual thirst that cannot be satisfied. Notice what he, I was, that scripture I read. He said, he, if you knewest thou the gift of God. If you knewest thou the gift of God. That's what Jesus was saying this, this morning. If you knew the gift that God has given to humanity, the one that can save you from your sins, salvation has been given to humanity. Uh, with, and, and with that, we talk about salvation. A lot of times we say, I'm saved from hell. Which that's a good thing. I'm glad I'm saved from hell. But it's much more than that. When we're talking about this and the gift and this water of life and this fountain, having your thirst satisfied, it means we have heaven. We have the promise of heaven given to us um, through salvation. That's part of what we're talking about here. This thirst this woman had, this longing. And Jesus said, If you knewest thou the gift of God and who it is that saith this unto thee, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, sitting there by the way of talking, by, talking to a hated woman, a, a woman that a lot of other people wouldn't even consider. And most certainly, if you was a Jew, you would not be talking to this woman. Because when the disciples come up, they was like, whoa, Jesus is up there talking to a Samaritan woman? Are you kidding me? See, Jesus, he, called, he crossed over those cultural barriers. He says, you need this gift. And then he spoke of this, in this last part, latter part of the verse, he says, he would have given thee, if she had asked, living water. This living water, you'll see, you hear these words as we look in the, the scripture that, that we was referring to, they referred to it in verse 6, a fountain of water of life. It's freely given. And this is what it is. This is a divine supply. Uh, this is heaven sent. Uh, this life this salvation, this heaven, everything that's been given, everything that's been promised has been done, and we're saved now. If you're a Christian, you're saved, you're glorified, and you are filled with the living God through the Holy Spirit of God. You have the Holy Spirit. And then we talk about this, this living water that's in us. It should be flowing up. It should be bubbling out. It should be reaching out. That's what we're talking about. This fountain that's given to you freely, all you got to do is come ask. God don't, God don't willing to any should perish, that all should come to a place of repentance. John 14, uh, John 4, 13 says, Jesus answered and saith to them, Whosoever drinketh, uh, drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But the one that drinks of that living water, that water that he offers, in verse 14, he says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. This is John 4, 14. But the water that I give him shall be in him. Listen to that. In him. A well of water 
springing up into everlasting life. What's one of the ways you know that you're a born-again Christian? Well, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Don't the Holy Spirit confirm that you're a child of God? I was speaking to somebody last week. We were talking about this question about their salvation. Oh, hey, you know you're saved. We are talking about that. You know you sin? Well, I know I'm saved. I know who I call the name. We can call that. But there's, a, there's another good indication. If you can go out there and sin, 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 there's no restraining spirit. There's nothing that says, boy, that's wrong, John. Boy, you need to repent. There's nothing in there. There's no, there's no remorse. There's no conviction as we use that term. There's a good chance the Holy Spirit of God is not dwelling in you and you're not a child of God. But when you have this, this well of, of water springing forth in you, this water that uh, is given by Jesus freely, you'll never thirst again. Well, when you go out and you sin, you say something to somebody. And you know it was wrong. You shouldn't have said that. You hurt their feelings. I mean, you know it. Sin clears the day. The Holy Spirit will convict you. You'll go back and say, oh, Miss Bessie, I'm so sorry I hurt your feelings. That wasn't Jesus at all. That was my flesh. See, there's a convicting spirit. We can't go out there and just like sin, sin, sin. You're a child of God. You walk down that road, and there's been many Christians that's been taken out of here because they continued down that path of sin. Here, he's talking about that living water. That fountain in verse 7 in, in, in Revelation, and, and we see it here in the Scripture. Uh, this is very much a part. Salvation is very much a part. Of, e of heaven, of eternal life, of, of satisfaction that, that only can be met through, jo through God. To, to say you'll never thirst again, and, and that whosoever can come. We see it again in Acts 2, 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That, that, that's that water. He wants to give it freely. There's no restriction on it. John 7, 38 says, And he that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of living water. You're going to see this. When you see this, I hope, it, I hope the Holy Spirit sends out the red light when you come to that. It says, ding, ding, ding. Look at that. There's that living water again. That's what happens to me. I learned something new in the Scripture. And boy, I'll go back and read some Scripture maybe I hadn't seen in a while. It's like, man, it's like it jumps off the page. At you. you got this living water, he said in John 7, 38. And it comes out of the, it's out of the belly. And that's it's, it's the innermost part of who we are. It flows as a river. You ever seen a river after a rain? A good heavy rain. I think that's what we had over here. There was a river coming down this gutter here and ran in the door because it stopped up. So it is, we're talking about this river. But out, it's like that's the way the Holy Spirit should be in us. Well, the Holy Spirit should be flowing out of us. And, and, and what does that look like? Well, it looks like love. It really does. looks like love in, in a sense. So, you know, to tell somebody you need to repent, that's love in there. People don't often see that. They think you're being mean. You go up here and say, boy, that's the meanest preacher I've ever heard preach. All I want to do is preach. He wanted to preach about my sin. He wanted to tell me what I was doing wrong. It's not about that at all. To say God has a river he wants you to drink. He has some, a fountain that's flowing with living water. He wants to give it to you freely. And all you need, you need to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus. That's loving him. We love their soul. You can think about your family members. You think, think you're being mean, uh, mean to them to approach them about their sin. But no, you're, you're loving them. To tell them that there's a, that there's a fountain that's flowing out of heaven. And, and his name's Jesus. And he, he's been given to man freely so that man will never thirst again. And the promise of heaven, they'll see. Otherwise, there is an alternative. And he's getting ready to get to that in the Scripture. here. He deals with this first. He, he deals with this first, that there's, there's a river flowing freely, and, and whosoever can come and drink of it. And he, he, he continues to uh, talk about this same person in verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. There's, hey, that's... The person of salvation can say, the person that's saved by grace can say, he's my God. He's my God. And God will say to you, you're my daughter. You're my son. Whew. Lord, I, I mean, that ought to sight us if we're saved. 
to have it to have the Creator God of heaven and earth to say, "I'm His Son." That's God, man. That don't more salvation. That don't encourage us this morning. No, no, you're a child of God, Doug. You're His child, and He's going to say to you, Doug, "You're my son." I can't say that. I can't say George is my daughter. That's still daughter. But God's going to say to every one of us that's saved by grace. And it won't matter whether Jill's in that family and I'm in this family. George is in that family and Isaiah's in that family. If we're all saved by grace, he's going to say we're family and we're all his children. Boy, ain't that good. Boy, think about that. <laughs> I don't know if you know about me because I don't deserve to be called his son. I ain't did nothing, John. I ain't did nothing to be called his son this morning. Boy, that ought to move us this morning. To know that there's a God in heaven that loves us that much to save us and give us a home in heaven and then to say, you're my son. Well, that's, that's so, I, I, I'm proud. I don't know about you, but my boys, I'm proud to say they're my sons. I, I love seeing that. I love to know they're my sons. God looks down on us, the one that overcomes. You see in the scripture, he said the overcomer. Listen, temptations and trials are going to come. Excuse me, we're, we're, still, we're still here. Uh, they're going to come to all believers. But through Christ, guess what? We're overcoming. We're overcoming. Death comes to all families. But guess what? Through Christ, death has been defeated. We don't have to fear those things. We don't have to fear those things. We don't have to fear death this morning. Why? Because I'm an overcomer. Hey, have you, have you pur ever pur purposed in your heart to do something? I have. Well, I'm going to do it no matter what. Courtney said he's crazy, he's crazy as a lamb. He'll go out and do something. I'm going to do it no matter what. Sometimes we pay for it, don't we? But there's one thing we need to purpose in our heart. We stay faithful to Jesus. Everything else don't matter, Larry. Most important thing this morning is for you to purpose in your heart you're going to be an overcomer. I'm staying true, Brother Clyde. Till I see his face, I'm staying faithful to the old book. I'm staying faithful to the cross. I'm staying faithful to walk after Jesus. This world has nothing. They have nothing in this world. There's nothing in the world that can satisfy you. Jesus says, you're a thirst. He said, I got the fountain. It's flowing. Boy, it's flowing. He said, that you don't have to thirst again. He said, you want the one that overcometh. And he can make reference here. You can make reference here uh, to the ones that overcame through the tribulation period. There's going to be those that we know uh, give their life during the tribulation period uh, for the cause of Christ to say, I'm here. <laughs> He's my God. And they're going to give their lives for him. Literally, physically give their lives for him. He might, he might be talking about those. Some of those that's overcome. But the ones here, he also he can, he can apply, he can make application to me and you. The one that overcometh. He said, I'll be your God. And, and, and uh, you notice this. Shall, he said, shall inherit. Shall inherit. I don't know if you ever, you ever inherited anything. Maybe somebody in your family passed on. They left you a house. You know, left you land. Maybe they left you a bill. Maybe you inherited a bill. Hey, either one. You could inherit either one. He said, here, uh, you shall inherit to the one that overcomes. And I don't know if you know what. You may not have much down here. You may not have much physical inheritance, inheritance on this earth. But God says, you're my son. And guess what? As being my son, you're an heir of God. You're an heir of God. He says this in Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that ain't no prosperity gospel right there, that he, we may be also glorified together. Heirs. I don't know if you know that this morning, but if you're a child of God, the, ones that's, the one that's willing to suffer, the one that's willing to go through the hard times, go through the frustration, go through all of these things that we go through here on earth, the one that says, I'm going to be an overcomer, I'm going to purpose in my heart, I'm staying faithful no matter what happens, that whether they come or don't come, I'm still going to preach the gospel. It does not matter. The one that overcomes, and he purposes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stay faithful to the Lord Jesus. That's the one he's talking about here. He said, uh, you're going to be an heir. 
And, and you're going to be an heir to what, I'm getting, what we're talking about. A new heaven, a new earth, a relationship with God that's unhindered by sin. A place of love, perfect peace. There's no death, no crying, no sorrow. All the tears have been wiped away. And the splendor that we're going to look at, this holy city coming down, this new Jerusalem, it's part of your inheritance this morning. He said, you're going to be a, you're going to be an heir. He said, maybe you not, well, maybe, maybe I'll inherit. And he said, no, you shall. He said, you will inherit these things to the one that has overcome. You're my son. Verse 8, he deals with the other side of it, the unbelieving. And notice what he says. But the fearful. We said like that fearful here. When you first read that, you think, well, who, who's he talking about? He's fearful. I'm fearful sometimes. He's not talking about a, a, a believer. But those, he's talking about those that for fear make no profession to know Jesus. They won't identify with him. They won't say, I, I, I know that's my God. That's the ones he's talking about. The fearful, the ones that, that's fear of standing up for him and saying, I'm a Christian. I, I'm saved by the grace of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is his precious word. The one that made no profession at all is the, the fearful. And then you have on the other flip side of it, those that's just completely unbelieving. They say, absolutely, there ain't no God in heaven. I'll never acknowledge there's a God. I'll never acknowledge there's a creator God. They refuse to believe. I truthfully believe that inside, let's take been given over to a reprobate mind, as we see in Romans. Inside, everybody knows there's a God. Look at the magnificence of even this broken world. Imagine, we see in a broken world, what, imagine a, a perfect world like heaven. We, the picture that we going, he gives us here is we give part of it, but there's splendor untold. <laughs> John, there's things we can, we, we'll discover when we get there. We'll say, wow, I didn't, even, I, I didn't even get a part of it. I didn't even understand all of it. But you're here, we think about this, the fearful. He's talking about the unbelieving, the ones that make no profession of faith. And the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the adulterers, the liars. Now listen, this ain't an exclusive list of sin. You know what everybody's always looking for? They're always looking for that one big sin. That's sin in hell. They're always looking for that one big sin. This is, list is not exclusive. It's not, oh, it's, it's uh, we think about this, there's the one thing. If everybody's looking for the one thing that is sin in hell, that one thing is rejecting Jesus and the plan of salvation. There, there is more sins than what's listed here. But he gives us this idea of uh, here with this list, they shall have their part here in the scripture here. There's a place for them. Their part is a place. Jesus said, I got a way to prepare you a place for the believer. But at the same time, for those that reject the Lord Jesus Christ, re reject the plan of salvation, he says, they shall have their part, their place, in the lake. It's a lake. How big is that lake? I, I don't know. Scripture doesn't give us any dimensions. We think, and our minds immediately go to a lake like we think here. I'll say this. The lake's big enough for all that will reject the Lord Jesus Christ. It'll hold every one of them. Okay? Every one of them that rejects Jesus has their place in this lake. And what about this lake? What is, what is this lake? It tells us in the scripture that it burns. It burns. It burns with fire and brimstone. In Matthew 3, 12, you can write it down and look at it later. It talks about the fire. Uh, and, and he says this in there, that the fire that's described is unquenchable. It's unextinguishable. That means David can't go back there and grab that fire extinguisher and put that fire out. So like that burning bush, ain't it? it? It burns and burns and burns. It ain't really consumed the bush. There's a fire in hell in this lake of fire. After the great white throne of judgment, he said, depart from me, I never knew you. They're cast into the lake of fire. We Listen, guys, I know we don't like talking about this. We need to talk about that lake that burns. That, that lake's burning right now. It's burning and burning and burning. So we see this. It's an unquenchable, unextinguished, inextinguishable fire. 
and it burns with, it's got brimstone. It's got brimstone. You notice there in the scripture, he said, brimstone. He said, and you know, brimstone, there's a, there's a little fact about brimstone. It is a highly combustible mineral. And, and brimstone produces a, <laughs> a suffocating smell. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> I, I can't <laughs> breathe. You know what I'm saying? It's a suffocating smell. It's part of hell. Continually. This ain't something you can that a person can get out of. We're talking about you now with heaven, we're talking about eternity. With hell, when we're talking about lake of fire, we're also talking about eternity. We're talking about eternity. A place that, that a place for that person that has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and <laughs> is burning with fire and brimstone. Does that sound like a place you want your loved one to go to? That should move us. Does that sound like you want your neighbor to go to it? No. I, I wouldn't even want my enemy to go there. Jill? Even my enemy, that's not even a place I'd want somebody that I really, I just don't like them. I wouldn't want them to go there. This place, it, it burns, and it'll burn for eternity. With fire and brimstone, the suffocating smell of it will continually be in their nose and their lungs and breathing, and they'll want to die, and they'll scream out and say, I don't want to be in this place, God. Oh, I believe now, I believe now. I've heard old preachers say, I believe the one that's in hell will remember, if we look back in the 16th chapter, uh, Jesus gives the example of the rich man at Lazarus. He said, and the man from hell remembered he had five brothers back there. He said, would you send Lazarus and, and please tell them? Please tell them they don't want to come to this place. So we see there, uh, that man from that illustration, he had all his senses in hell. We see he had his memory in hell. I said, he'll remember every gospel message he ever heard. He'll remember the plan of salvation. And, and at that point, he'll want to say, oh Lord, I, I believe now it's too late. This is an eternal place. It says, so guys, it's hard. You can't talk about heaven without talking about hell, can you? I mean, because there's two eternities. There's two paths. We see that from the very beginning. What I preach? The broad way, the narrow way. All of this fits together just so, the Word of God is so good, guys. I'm telling you, it's just, it just fits together perfectly. I mean, thousands of years pinned apart, and it can fit together perfectly. Two different writers. And it fits together perfectly. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And you're going to tell me there's no God? You're going to tell me this is not the inspired Word of God? Man can't write this. When we look at that, he can't write this. When you're talking about a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, it's God. This is the eternity to those that reject Him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I told you that, that list, don't get stuck on that list. And they said this, it's the second death. It's the second death. The second death is uh, mentioned on multiple occasions in in the book of Revelation alone, and uh, it, it's 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 synonymous with this this lake of fire uh, here. And when we look at it, it it's a death that uh, it means separation from God. The second death here means separation from God, just like us. But when we die. We don't have to fear death. Death has been conquered through the cross. We don't have to have a fear of death. We have a promise of heaven. But for these people, these people that have rejected Jesus Christ, the lake, they have a place in the lake of fire. The second death for them will be terrible. Uh, and probably one of the most terrible things that they don't even realize, and I don't even know that we completely understand, is that they're going to be separated from God for eternity. I don't know if you know this. The only thing holding this world together, the only thing holding you together, is God. It's God. Even in your, even in your lost condition, God has provided for you. You get the rain. Remember we studied? You get the rain fall. Well, God provides. He puts food in your refrigerator, even in a lost condition. But then, here, it's going to be separation from the provider. It's a terrible thing, guys. And it should motivate us to, it should move us 
to love on these kids a little more. They're kids now, but they'll come to a day where they understand they got to make a decision just like me and you. They'll have to decide, is this Jesus real? Is there, is there really a creator God? Every one of these kids is going to have to decide that. Yeah? That's what we have to think about. Their soul has a place in one of the eternities, right? <laughs> he said, I got to prepare a place. Here we see there's a place. I can wholeheartedly tell you that there's a place for your soul in one of two, in two eternities this morning. And, and the only thing standing in the middle is Jesus. His second death is a terrible time. It, it, it's, it's, it's a physical death. We go through this physical death, but here, his second death is exclusive for those who have rejected Christ. It's not a place we as believers have to fear. You don't have to fear this. What, what I just told you this morning, if you're a believer, you don't have to fear this. <laughs> hey, that's good this morning. He said, you don't have to fear this. Let's look here. The second death. I think it's probably where we're going to stop this morning. Second day. Stand with me this morning. Stand with me for just a little bit. Heaven's a wonderful promise. It's a wonderful promise.